We are putting a complete siege on Gaza. No electricity, no food, no water, no gas, it's all closed. We're fighting animals and are acting accordingly. When you hear some YouTube personalities or cable news talking heads, you know you're getting a strong point of view. Vox feels different. With a low-key style and slick graphics and beautiful maps, you walk away thinking you have the full story. But that can be deceiving. Vox's Gaza Explained gives its overview of the conflict between Israel and Gaza. In its first month online, it had 3 million views. And if you know little about the conflict, you may feel satisfied and think that you know what's going on. But if you have any historical knowledge at all, it's clear that Vox's explainer is really closer to propaganda, a term I don't use often. We're now living in an era where supposedly solid news outlets have abandoned the concept of even-handed, or even somewhat fair. Instead, they're agenda-driven for whatever cause they see as the greater good or would be popular with their audience. But when you hear claims about misinformation or fake news by name-brand news organizations, they almost never make up facts. That's too easy to prove wrong, and they'll fire a reporter who intentionally lies. Instead, their number one tactic is to push a cause by ignoring relevant facts. Now, in any news presentation, editing is part of the job. You can't report every fact or every counterargument. But in this case, and I'll point them out, Vox doesn't just ignore minor points. It ignores vital information that counters their narrative. Before I go any further, though, I need to make this clear. Almost everything I'm going to add here is going to be pro-Israeli. And that's not because I'm trying to convince you to support that side, but because Vox is pretending that this is journalism, when essentially all it does is present a pro-Palestinian, anti-Israeli viewpoint. Now, I've been to Israel and to Gaza, and I can tell you firsthand that there are good people on both sides of that conflict. I've had colleagues who were kidnapped by bad people in Gaza, and I worked with some great Gazans to help free them. I even got help from Ismail Haniya, the head of Hamas. So I'm not cheerleading for any one point of view here. So let's look into narrative framing. Essentially, it's deciding your story beforehand and then making sure every quote, every fact supports that narrative. The facts that are left out, the people they interview, the words they spin are all moving towards a simple narrative. In Vox's case, the narrative is this. Through an unjust occupation and harsh blockade, the blame for October 7th and the entire war lies with Israel. Every action by Hamas is just a byproduct of that. Every fact that counters that argument Vox just ignores. By the end of the video, Vox wraps up by making their narrative crystal clear. Here are the last few sentences. I think that anybody who follows Israeli and Palestinian politics, like with some level of honesty, it knew that if what happened hadn't happened, something else was going to happen because the status quo was unsustainable. The world has to recognize this suffering even before we have escalations. The reason we have escalations is because people cannot find any hope. No one wanted to get to this point. The tragedy of it all, in my mind, I think besides the loss of human life, is that it was preventable, easily preventable. Everything in between supports that narrative. Now, the first trick Vox plays is to stack the deck. That tough talk from the Israeli defense minister, it's the last time we hear a quote from the Israeli point of view in the entire 15 minute video. The Vox producer, Raja Ilidrisi, doesn't even give a nod towards balancing the interviews at all. Each one speaks strongly for the Palestinian side. Now throughout, Vox plays word games. Sometimes they give the Palestinians the most descriptive words. Compare this. Hamas launched rockets killing over 1,400 civilians and kidnapped close to 200 people. To this, Israel bombarded the Gaza Strip, killing several thousand, wiping out entire families and striking ambulances, border crossings and residential buildings. That kind of language is somewhat typical throughout. Other times, Vox will be sure to give the Arab side's rationale in describing an event, but only rarely do they do the same for Israel. For instance, the day Israel became a country, every surrounding Arab neighbor declared war against it. Vox frames it this way. Many others were forced to flee to neighboring Arab countries. Overwhelmed by refugees, these countries immediately declared a war against the new state of Israel to support Palestinian Arabs. The Vox history starts in 1947. From a Palestinian point of view, that's a good year to start the conversation. 
Since it's undeniable that after the UN created the State of Israel, hundreds of thousands of Arabs fled or were thrown from their homes by the Israelis. Now, I don't blame Vox for not explaining thousands of years in conflict in depth, but it's a mistake to think that there was a functioning Palestinian country that the Jews took over and kicked them out of. It was a mishmash. And the British had ruled the area since right after World War I, and since 1917 had the goal of establishing a Jewish homeland there. Jews can point back to at least 3,000 years when King David ruled Israel, and Arabs can point to Muslim regimes that ruled the areas for centuries. Just flip through the Old Testament and you'll see that this easily preventable tragedy is quite possibly the longest running war zone in human history. So things like that are journalistic misdemeanors. Now let's get to the felonies. The first is Vox's continued use of the word occupation. The Prime Minister of the Israeli occupation, Benjamin Netanyahu. This was the beginning of the Israeli occupation in Gaza that continues today, boycotts against occupation. But the occupation of the Palestinian territories has been since 1967. Protester signs routinely call it an occupation, but the reality is more nuanced. Certainly Israel occupies the West Bank, where they have a military and civilian presence. And from 1967 to 2005, the situation was the same in Gaza, until Israel forcibly removed Jewish settlers and all of its soldiers from the Strip. Given that, how can anyone assert an occupation? By changing the very definition of the word. They say that Israel's blockade of Gaza, with a highly restricted land border, airspace, and ocean access, is the equivalent of an occupation. And this blockade is the heart of Vox's narrative to justify the Hamas invasion. But to do so, it deceives viewers both through its beautiful maps, but also for ignoring basic information that counters their narrative. For the last 16 years, residents here have been living under a harsh blockade. Israel put Gaza under the official blockade that continues today, tightening Israel's grip over Gaza even more, trapping over 2 million Palestinians inside. But Vox never addresses two fundamental concepts that viewers need to understand about the situation. The first, missiles. More specifically, we're never given a reason why Israel would implement a boycott except hate and punishment, as Vox's Palestinian voices condemn what they call collective punishment. Israel calls it self-defense. There's never been even a year of peace since Israeli disengagement, where Hamas or other groups in Gaza have restrained from shooting missiles into Israel. And not just a handful, thousands. And it actually went well beyond missiles. It included blowing up buses and cafes, random stabbing, shootings, and vehicle rammings. Without a wall, Israel couldn't stop that flow of terrorism into its country. Even with a wall, Hamas built hundreds of miles of tunnels to smuggle weapons into Gaza and operatives into Israel to stage attacks. It's totally true that Gazans can't leave, but Vox ignores one fact so important that there's no chance they did it by accident. That fact is Egypt. It's a joint Israeli-Egyptian blockade, and it's been that way for 16 years. The Egyptians built their own wall along the eight-mile border it shares with Gaza, and it has complete control over the Rafah Gate. Egyptian patrol boats help enforce the blockade from the sea as well. And people, too. Egypt could have allowed refugees or visitors into either Egypt or any other of the Arab countries that dominate the region, but they don't. Now, why is a longer discussion, and I wrote about it in my substack. But in short, Egypt has its own problems, and they're not keen on a militaristic, often suicidal neighbors to their north. And while other Arab countries routinely criticize Israel, almost no one talks about how they could help turn Gaza into a functioning, normal country. If Gaza is a prison, Egypt is as culpable as Israel. And if you define a blockade as an occupation, then it's an Egyptian occupation as well. That Vox completely ignores Gaza's western border is nothing less than staggering dishonesty. In fact, the Palestinian Authority itself even implemented sanctions against Gaza in 2018, hoping it would make things bad enough inside there that Palestinians would revolt against Hamas, something that never happened. A final point about the blockade, also unmentioned by Vox, is that while it's blamed for keeping out vital supplies, it certainly did let in thousands of weapons, either through tunnels underneath or through checkpoints, enough to support an army of 30,000 men in a region with only 2 million people. Nowhere does Vox even entertain the notion that Hamas prioritized warfare over building Gaza into a decent place to live. It always blames the Israeli blockade. In fact, Hamas doesn't really get much attention in the Vox world for good reason. They call Hamas a militant group, and Israel calls it a terrorist organization, but both those terms minimize what it actually was before the war. It was the government of Gaza. 
It was responsible for everything from roads to hospitals to courts. It controlled billions of dollars, mostly from foreign governments, that came into Gaza each year. Vox explains that Israel reacted poorly to Hamas, both winning legislative elections in Gaza and then taking over in a bloody coup. Yet Vox doesn't mention why that was troublesome. It's because Hamas, again, the official government of Gaza, has pledged to destroy Israel. Its charter makes that clear in pledging a jihad against Israel. And it's not just lofty hate speech. Hamas has continually attacked Israel physically and made it clear that coexistence wasn't an option, only the destruction of Israel. And even while Israel was waging war, killing Hamas by the thousands, their leaders still vowed to carry out more attacks like October 7th. You certainly can't say they're quitters. As poor of a job as they've done in ousting Israel, they've persisted. And inside of Gaza, Hamas ruled with an iron fist, yet it was still relatively popular. Palestinian public opinion polls sometimes conflict, but most show that over half of Gazans had a positive view of Hamas. After the war started, Hamas's popularity surged, and a clear majority supported the October attacks on Israel. Only 10% said they believe Hamas had actually committed any war crimes. Let me put in a caveat here, though. Public opinion polls in countries where the government routinely murders its opposition, that often skews polls themselves. But an even more important reason for Hamas's tenacity, or at least their survival, is another word not mentioned by Vox. Iran. The U.S. State Department estimates Iran gives about $100 million a year to fund the violence. Other sources say that increased to $350 million in the year before the October 7th attack. Iran also gave Hamas technical help to manufacture rockets, arm drones, and conduct advanced military training. Nevertheless, Hamas fared less well against the Israeli army than it did against mainly unarmed civilians on October 7th. There's one area, though, where Hamas and Palestine have excelled in this conflict, public relations. And Vox helps this cause every step of the way. Part of that success stems from the misinformation we've discussed, and part of it, quite frankly, comes from anti-Semitism. Animosity against Jews has stretched back for thousands of years, and it's a topic of a future video of mine. But a large part also comes from the imbalance of deaths in the conflict, which has defined it for decades. Israel would be attacked with a volley of rockets or kidnappings or blown up buses, and it would eventually respond back with a greater attack. And as gruesome as it is to compare dead body statistics, accurate or not, doing so always makes the Palestinians look like the victims. It works for public relations, and Vox dutifully plays the game with their graphics. Now, from the Israeli point of view, they just want to exist without their neighbor trying to kill them repeatedly. From the Gazan point of view, Jews are on their land and they need to get out no matter what. Vox also completely ignores the concept of human shields. Hamas plays an ugly game here, and they certainly have a hand in the death of innocent Palestinians themselves. When you place your weapons or fighters under hospitals or in schools, apartment buildings, and mosques, then launch military actions, you're intentionally putting those people at harm's way. Palestinians either deny this happens or argue it's their only chance to win. Vox just ignores it altogether, playing the numbers game to support the narrative. In the final analysis, the Palestinian fight to expel Israel hasn't gone well for them, and the footage on both sides of the war is stomach churning. But Vox doesn't help the situation by deceiving millions about the fundamental aspects of the conflict. People are protesting, sometimes violently, over this. And disinformation can be dangerous, something Vox has told us many times in the past. Now, I don't want to pretend that I have no opinions or that I'm perfect here, but I'm doing my best to be intellectually honest. I may make mistakes, but I'm trying to be fair so that you can make up your own mind and not have some worldview spoon-fed to you. Tell me where I messed up below and keep thinking for yourself. If you believe I gave you things straight, come back again for another video. I'm Ken LaCourt. Thanks for watching.